Is this working? Can you guys hear me okay? Excellent. Thank you for that nice introduction. So, um, we are actually, I think, all quite excited about where the web is going and uh, what, what, it's, what it's doing. And I think we wouldn't be here if we all didn't like massively love the open web. We're all in a certain sense kind of big open web standards. Not just simply regular web, but like the open web, open standards, really kind of moving across all screens, all devices, and flirting with this idea of what does it mean to use the web on the watch. But I have to say that we also are a very kind of broad community. We are very, how shall I say, proud of the fact that we've accomplished so much. I was at Cardiff at the WebIs last week, which is a really great conference, by the way. I really enjoyed that. And we celebrated that the web is 25 years old. And we really have accomplished an awful lot in 25 years. But there's a certain, shall we say, crowd of us that are a little bit too proud. We, we've accomplished so much. We become kind of web fanboys. And we kind of take umbrage at the fact that there are, shall I say, alternatives to the web that act like usurpers. And we are a little bit like Loki, you know, the god, the, the, the villain on Thor. I collect comics, and uh, I really like the fact that Loki is one of my favorite villains. He's actually a lot more nuanced than the movie. But we often act like Loki when we're defending the web, when something comes along that challenges our dominance. It's a little bit like this. I am a god, you dull creature. And I will not be bullied by that. Now that might have been a little bit too subtle for you. <laughs> but we are effectively having the snot kicked out of us by iOS at times. And, uh, and by extension, Android. And I think it's actually a false dichotomy. Um, yes, they're doing well mostly in gaming, by the way. But it's a very different way of looking about it. I love what basically has Paul Irish has said, that mobile and web, they have complement each other. It's really not a fight. I really am tired about this idea of native versus web going on and on and on. They, too, they do two very different things. Uh, and in fact, some of the more uh, enlightened companies appreciate that, and they use the web for onboarding, and they use native for your really hardcore fans. But that's a, I digress a little bit. Uh, the issue for me, though, is that we, as the web community, frankly, take that on board. We get so excited about adding things like geolocation and compass and microphones and so forth because what we, w we wait for the native apps to actually go do it first, and then we kind of add it afterwards. I've even had some people say, well, yeah, I mean, they're doing that proprietary shit. Okay, but then we come back and we do it right. You know, we do it open. And that's fine, but then, of course, they turn to law and they do something else. And my issue is, why are we aspiring to be where native was three years ago? That's just not the kind of world I want to live in. I think that the web can do so much more. And we shouldn't try to copy what native was. It's not a criticism of native. It's a criticism of us as to where we want to go. And this really comes into focus, particularly in these last couple years, as we've gone crazy with smart devices. And I get a little grumpy with the phrase Internet of Things. It's, it's all the rage right now, and people kind of go a little bit off the deep end on it. But let's just take smart devices, where you've got smart doorknobs, smart thermostats, smart bathroom scales. These are all direct devices that want to be controlled, and each and every one of them has their own app, which is fine, because really it's the only thing you can do right now. But the problem I'm finding is that People are really claiming, and I actually am agreeing with this, that this is going to really take off. If you believe in Moore's Law at all, as this goes forward in the next couple of years, we're going to have millions of these devices. And if everyone requires an app, we're going to put them all on our phone? I mean, it just doesn't scale. It just doesn't make any sense. So this was kind of, I stole this from Jason Grigsby. Um, when I, I left Google for a couple of years, and I was a creative director at Frog Design in San Francisco. And we kept trying to get our clients to use the web, and they just had to have an app. We need an app. Apps are cool. It was like this app myopia. It was so frustrating because we'd make the app for them, and they'd come back six months later and like, no one's installing our app. <laughs> because it's, it's one thing to have an app. It's another one to get people to install it. And people kind of forget that little subtlety. Because what ended up happening, we actually did a little study where we, you know, we would watch people, and there's a sign, you know, we're in the app store. And they would be kind of going, Pfft can't be bothered because I'm busy. And 
Again, I, I want to make sure that people don't turn me into this kind of caricature. I don't hate apps. I think apps are cool. But there's this, what we called at Frog, this kind of thin crust of effort. You, you have to amortize the effort of an app across the number of times you use it. So if you're using Snapchat, you can install that app. That's cool. But if you're going to walk past a vending machine in Berlin Airport and you're going to use it one time, you're not going to do that. Okay? It's just not going to happen. And I think this is effectively the difference between native and web, because web, you just click on a link and you're just using it. So, and in fact, this has even been written about. Last, uh, two weeks ago, uh, this came out on Slate. Paul Adams, a lot of you guys know, came up with this. And these are basically articles that are now kind of attacking the very concept of an app and where we need to go. It's like the cracks are beginning to form. Now, you may disagree with these articles, but the point is, is that we're starting to say, wait a second, Apps aren't the only toolkit in the tool chest. Now, clearly, I don't need to explain it to you guys, but I'm sure your clients <laughs> are the ones that have to, you have to have this talk with. Because what ends up happening, of course, is that in, an, in a world of exponential growth, one of my favorite quotes of Ray Kurzweil, who, let's just say, is an interesting character, um, one of his more interesting quotes was that in an exponential curve, humans tend to think linearly. So when something is first starting off at the bottom, we tend to slag it off and say, see, it'll never amount to anything. It's just rubbish, right? And then when it really happens, it's kind of like, oh, wow, wait a second. I, I knew this was cool all along. And it's just like this. We don't tend to really think properly about an exponential trend. The classic example of this is Yahoo. For those of you who are old enough to remember Yahoo, when it came out in the 90s, um, it was actually a list of hierarchical links that were put there by hand by humans. People forget that the H in Yahoo stands for hierarchical. And this is a classic example of linear thinking, because it's like, oh, the web, we'll just simply just hire a few folks and they'll just type them in, no big deal, right? <laughs> but I am not talking about iBeacon. iBeacon is frankly a lovely technology and it's good at what it is. I mean, people, I, mean I, I worked at Apple for eight years, okay? So like, I, 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 I kind of like them a little bit. But the problem with iBeacon is that if you go into a mall with I, and 15 stores have iBeacon installed, You've got to install 15 separate apps. And I point this out to people that kind of go, really? And I'm like, yeah, exactly. that, that's how it's designed. And it just, it just doesn't, it's thinking linearly. It's the Yahoo of Internet of Things. And so what people keep forgetting is that apps are great when you have effective, this, this is my totally made up graph. Just, it's, it's just all totally fi you know, fictional, but just to say, when you first have just the apps on your phone, you have zero devices in your house, you, native apps are cool. The very first smart device comes out like Nest, and everyone kind of goes, whoa, this is awesome, I can have an app to control it, and kind of goes crazy. But then it starts to break down. In the United States, I went to a marketing association of vending machines of America, and I did a search, and they have 974, as of last week, uh, companies that you know, sell vending machines and you know, fill them out. I'm not going to install 974 vending machine apps proactively you know, to get something to have happen. Or every bus stop, or every lost luggage tag, or every uh, park bench, or, or every, um, every parking meter. There's a fact, as more and more devices start becoming smart, we're actually going to get what I would call the long tail of interaction, which is kind of what the web is all about. It's a really different way of thinking about it, kind of think, getting everything to kind of get, getting down into the trivial, into the corner cases. But it's not trivial to you, it's your particular corner case. So for example, and I'm gonna kind of beat you over the head with nine different examples here. Let's say you're gonna to go to a museum and there was information on that particular piece of art. Or you walk by a poster for a play and you wanna like get a V card for it. Or a, or a movie uh, poster here for pizza and you would like to just simply get the phone number for it. In, in this particular case, we're not talking about an app. We're not talking about even something that's interactive. We're just talking about a little bit of data. Or a printer in your office, and it just says, try these three things. If it doesn't work, just call this number. Basic stuff like that. Or a pill bottle from your pharmacist, uh, chemist, sorry. And um, you basically, instead of getting that 18 folding page onion skin things in three languages, you just simply get a couple of paragraphs and maybe a YouTube video that has side effects and uh, a bus stop or a parking meter. And this is now getting into more of the vending machine type of idea. Or in the case of uh, renting bicycles, each one of these things is kind of a tiny little thing that no normal human being, that means by definition like no one in this room, um, um, would ever install the application to do that. Um, and so 
what's fun is I hadn't really counted on, when I, when I started off this project, I actually really thought that it would be mostly about application interfaces, but it's actually about data. It's about the web. It's about tiny bits of information you just want people to kind of give to you. But here's the critical question. Can the web do this today? And of course the answer is absolutely no way. And that's where this kind of this switch needs to happen. So whenever we talk about the web, we get really excited about the DOM and everything that goes inside of that. It's like this white magic square that can do really, really cool things. But over the last 25 years, how much has that place changed? Hardly at all. The big innovation is that when I type T, it auto-completes to Twitter. You know, that's the big change in the last 25 years that it's done, which frankly is kind of cool, but it's still not what I'd call really, really leaps and bounds, right? We've taken the most amazing and I believe this with all my heart, to the most amazing rendering engine on the planet, and we've strapped a goddamn DOS prompt on top of it. Really, is the way you go from site to site just to go dub, 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 dot cnn, dot com, return? It's like, that is like 70s shit. I'm sorry. That's like really old school thinking. These phones have sensors on them. How about we use them for the web? So in effect, the web needs a discovery service, a way to kind of bridge that back. That, let's just, let's be clear, is a hell of a lot better than QR codes, because everybody knows that QR codes suck, right? So what we're talking about here is a system where, imagine you've got a couple of smart devices in the room, and they're broadcasting URLs in some way out into the open, so that you, when you walk into the room, you basically can whip out your phone, and here's a critical thing, when you ask, Really important, this cannot beep in your pocket. That would be really, really irritating. And let's be really clear, almost every retailer on the planet wants to beep in your pocket, but that's a separate conversation. Um, when you ask, you then basically grab those beacons, rank them so that you get the ones that you like, that are most important to you, possibly by distance. And then you actually, when you click on it, it actually goes to that web page. That's it. <laughs> this is not like really some complicated idea. It's literally just trying to get you to a web page quickly. The kind of the geeky way I put it, which uh, doesn't always work, but I think it'll work well in this, team, in this crowd, is this is what I call proximity DNS. It's literally getting the things that are nearby you into your browser. So this is the, what the, the project is called the physical web. And it's really basically trying to bridge the physical and the web world. So in this case, you walk up to Zipcar. Zipcar is broadcasting a URL. It comes to your phone. But because it's the web, it says, do you have a cookie? No, you don't. Well, then I'll give you the attract page, which can say, this is cool. This is why you should sign up. But if you have the cookie, it kind of goes, welcome back, Scott. You want this car? And you hit unlock. The car unlocks, and you drive away. Uh, I first announced this at Google I.O. back in May. I actually called up Zipcar, and they were like, we would totally use this. Because the point is, it's really easy for customers to have our app. It's really hard for not customers to have our app. And so this is a way for people that are not your customer to kind of get pulled in. Uh, I even got them to donate a car for Google I.O., but unfortunately, there was already four cars in the showroom, so they wouldn't let me have it. It's really frustrating. It's, when, when you get someone to give you a car, you kind of want to take it, but, you, you know, but I couldn't. It was really frustrating. So the idea is, effectively, everything has a web page, but let's interpret that very loosely. This could be just a RESTful interface, but the point is you have a URL that takes you there. Uh, instant interaction, walk up and use and there's no apps to manage or delete. That's the basic idea here. And as I said before, it's like a, a proximity DNS type of thing. Now, um, so how does this work? And I added this just for Remy, okay? It's definitely not iBeacon. So what this is right now is effectively we're using Bluetooth Low Energy for the moment. I'll explain that in a minute. And so what we do is we take advantage of the advertising packet. And every second, we just send out a URL in the advertising packet. Uh, by the way, has anybody played with Bluetooth Low Energy? Just raise your hand. That's really low. OK. Um, but it's, a, it's actually a pretty cool technology. We're using just the teeniest slice of it. And so it basically broadcasts once a second in what's called the advertising packet. We're kind of actually hacking Bluetooth Low Energy. The, the advertising packet is meant to say things like, you've got a Fitbit. And it's called Fitbit B75 or something. It's, it's really meant to be effectively a naming mechanism but we're kind of hijacking that to broadcast this. And it just goes out, and eventually your phone kind of comes along and kind of goes, hey, I see that, okay? And it picks that up, and then it uses that URL. We're, uh, we're, that's kind of the basic way we're doing it. We're just looking for URLs that are being you know, broadcast. And so there are basically three technical ways you can kind of hook this together. One is that you have, see, a bus stop. The URL is broadcast. You pick it up, 
and you just simply just go to the web. It's literally, frankly, it's exactly the same as a QR code. It just doesn't suck, right? Um, uh, the other issue, of course, is that I can do 50 at once from 50 meters away, which I don't think QR codes can really touch, right? So that's another big advantage. So the intention is that you can just snarf these things up and just go somewhere. That's the easy case, and you can just whip that up right now. So the example here would be is like we just say, hey, the next bus is in three minutes, and the next one is in 17 minutes. It's just simply just giving me data. It's quite the exact opposite. If you've ever used city bus apps, they're actually really kind of horrible because you've got to find it, you've got to launch it, and then GPS has got to fire up. And like, which line do you want to have? And it's, just, it's like step, 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 step. It's like, no, just tell me the next bus. It flips the whole UX problem on its head. Cloud pass-through is the next one, which um, I've hacked up myself, which is you've got a vending machine that broadcasts a URL. You go to the cloud and you get a little web page that says, what do you want to do? And like, you know, takes care of payment and so forth. And actually, once you pay, it then has a web socket connection, which sends a message directly to the machine, which is also on the internet. And then it drops you know, your snack. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with you folks. I kind of glossed this over. Um, I actually bought a vending machine on Craigslist for 250 bucks. Um, and they're heavy. <laughs> they're really, it's, it was, it's, it, they're basically kind of like a, like a safe on wheels because they're designed to not be broken into. Uh, so I bought it and I took it all apart and they had a little, little uh, a bill feeding machine, which was really great because I opened it up, there's 26 bucks in there. And uh, so I, I really got it for two, 200, not 225. And I ripped all the guts out, put in a Raspberry Pi, put Node on it, and basically have it broadcasting Bluetooth, but I also have it have an Ethernet connection so that when I get, go to the web page, I just have a web socket connection and I just, and I just send a, a message to the Raspberry Pi and it spins the little servo and then it drops. So I've been you know, preaching this for months at Google, set this thing up, and brought back, and everyone's been hearing about this, but they walk by and they hit the button and the candy drops and they lose their shit. They're like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> and it's just like, it's like, really? It takes a candy bar to get you to see this idea? But there's something about a demo that's really cool. So this is the video that we do. <laughs> uh, well, so here's the app that we have running. It shows you the beacons that are nearby. So you, you ask to see it, and there's a candy bar. And that's just the web page. Actually, on DigitalOcean. And it's so cool that it makes that really, really loud sound. It really kind of completes the experience. But um, what was stunning to me, and this is a total geek point of view, I thought for sure it'd be like a two or three second delay, but it's like 100 milliseconds. You tap that button and that sucker just spins. It's really satisfying. Yeah. And, um, and so, um, and people, again, I'm going to go into technical detail. People kind of go, this is way too complicated. Everything's not going to have an Ethernet connection. Of course they're not. But like GSM modems now are becoming very inexpensive. I don't know, uh, Sigfox is in France. They're actually doing a trial in the United States. They've got GSM modems for a couple of bucks. And they have data plans for literally a buck a year. No, not a lot of data. But the point is, we're, things are going to have what I call Kindle connectivity. They're going to have their own internet connectivity baked into it. And this is the perfect technology. You're on your internet, I'm on my internet, let's just talk, let's just talk right? So this is going to become much more, much more common. Um, Matt Sibitroff in my group has put this together with a little racer car and then again another Raspberry Pi. And this is just basically a joystick. And as you go left and right, it just sends socket events and you can drive the car across the floor. It's really fun. Um, so it's, uh, we're kind of putting together all sorts of ways to play with this. Now, the one that gets people most excited, though, is the one you can't do yet, which is what I call the direct connect, which is the case where you get the same URL, you still go to the cloud, but what you get back is effectively a web page with JavaScript in it, and the JavaScript opens a connection straight to the device, at which case you avoid the cloud altogether. Chrome apps have this right now. They have a Bluetooth JavaScript library, but once, and this is why I feel so strongly that this needs to be a very, very thin project. I'm just doing the discovery. Once the Chrome team, JavaScript team, heard about this, they were like, let's make this public. Let's actually take this Chrome Apps library and make it part of the web sandbox so that every browser could do this. So now you're not only using the screen of your phone, you're actually using the internet connection. So you would walk up to a parking meter, it'd give you the page, you'd do the payment in the cloud, and then it would send an encrypted token to the device that says, put on 30 minutes. Now, Happy Meals could actually do something. Uh, quadcopters or parking meters, now things become really cheap and it really explodes. But this obviously is about a year away. This takes a little while for this to go. So, and I get this question all the time, what about tracking? 
And since you don't know much about Bluetooth Low Energy, I mean, most of you folks don't, let me explain what happens. So what we do is that this is an advertising packet, and it just broadcasts over and over and over again. And we have it in non-connectable mode, so it doesn't listen. It just, just broadcasts. So that when the phone picks it up, it takes that URL and it goes straight to the cloud. There is something called a scan response packet, and there are things called GAP services, but we don't use them so that you don't connect back to the unit. It literally is the idea is if a thousand people walk into an airport with a thousand beacons, those beacons have no idea you're there. That's by design, so that it can't be tracked. Now, there are some subtleties we can get into about how a rogue beacon could start to get more information, but for the most part, we're trying very hard to kind of keep that to a minimum. This is kind of the opposite of what happens with Wi-Fi, MAC address sniffing, if you guys are familiar with that problem. We're trying to avoid that. So currently, we're using Bluetooth because it's like the new black, right? Every phone has it, every new phone has it, and it's becoming quite popular. But the goal here from the Chrome team's perspective in general is to just get more URLs in the world. That's the basic idea. So we're now doing a version uh, this week that's trying to work on MDNS, if you guys are familiar with how MDNS works. And it's kind of a pro and a con. Uh, the pro is that I can walk into someone's, if, if I walk into my house and I'm on my protected Wi-Fi, I can get URLs that my neighbor can't. Big, big privacy win, right? Only things that, that I'm authenticated on, I can see. So that's a huge advantage for home use. Downside is that I see every single thing on my Wi-Fi. So if I have two TVs, whether I'm in front of the first one or the second one, I see them both. I have no proximity of any kind. So part of the reason we're doing all this stuff in the open is to kind of talk about it and, and think about it. Because we could, for example, combine the two technologies. We don't know yet. I'm just, this is like an exercise to the reader, if you guys want to talk to me about this. The idea is that maybe we could broadcast some kind of hash or some kind of thing that's not exactly the same URL, and then we can match them up so that I can see the six things in my house, but the one I'm closest to would show up at the top of the list. So this is the kind of work in progress. We would also even consider ultrasonic as well because it's, it, there's problems with it, but we want to have this be the URL detection service. We don't want this to be the Bluetooth low energy thing that's sometimes, sometimes called iBeacon. You know. So another example, I threw this in for you guys, is that we're trying to come up with standards on how to use URLs. So let's say that you go into, and this is hypothetical, there's probably issues with this, but you go into a restaurant and you put a beacon underneath every single table. And you're at cafeco.com. And each table has a different URL with a hash on it. And what we could do is say, well, you know what we're going to do? Everything past the hash we're going to ignore. So what we're going to basically treat this as just one giant URL. So on the phone, we'll just show cafe company. And when you click on it, you go to the web page, give them the full URL, and then kind of go, oh, your table, your table six. Okay? So when you place the order, the food just comes straight to your table. Uh, the idea here is about trying to build unique ways to use URLs to give a cleaner user experience. We're already deduping URLs, so if you were to say blanket this whole building with just URLs for this particular theater, you'll only see one. But we want to be a little bit more clever about it. And again, we're reaching out to the community to say, well, wait a second, why don't you try something else? Hash is stupid. Don't use hash. Use you know, parameters or something. So we're, we're, this is just something we're just talking about out loud right now. In fact, this is an issue right now in the GitHub. So key thing, this is a fledgling idea. This is the equivalent of an RFC. It's uh, an open web proposal that we're doing. And it's really definitely, I'm going out of my way to not make this a Google product. Because if this is a Google product, it's doomed, right? This only makes sense if this is something that we, as a community, think is a good idea, which is why we've open sourced it and why we put it on the GitHub and why we're kind of, I'm doing talks like this. If it's not considered to be a good idea collectively, it'll never succeed. This can't succeed as an individual product. Uh, but the fun part is that um, I was really not prepared for this. Literally four weeks ago, I did one tweet that said, I'm so glad to announce I'm finally doing this. This thing just kind of went nuts. I was on TechCrunch within 20 minutes. I was not ready for that. Um, um, and we have, uh, as of this morning, we were like four shy of 3,000 followers on our GitHub, which is really cool. Um, so we're getting time. And right now, for example, um, we, so many people want beacons to play with. And uh, we posted one example from our Arduino, and within a week we had five other ones that people had just done on their own. And just kind of did. this is why open source is just so cool. People just add stuff and put it on, and so forth. So we've been getting an awful lot of engagement. But my my point with you guys is, please go there. Please ask issues. Please say you completely screwed up. You forgot something. The whole, we're not going to get anywhere unless you guys kind of really bang on it and ask ask the hard questions. 
So let me step back and realize that this is actually a pretty starry-eyed dreamer kind of idea, because what we're trying to do is to kind of create two completely different categories of devices. We want to have a whole bunch of devices that are just broadcasting URLs, and hopefully, on the other side, there's a bunch of people that are listening. And who's, it's a chicken or egg. Like, who's going to build this into their product? You know, who's going to build a receiver? This is kind of like trying to reinvent SMS in some ways. And, and if you've SMS has been written about to death, right? I thought it's an, it was a happy accident. And everyone's tried to do it themselves. The difference is that what we're trying to do right now is to just start simple. Just get the idea out there, get people playing with it, and seeing if it makes sense. And if you guys remember Growl for Macintosh, just curious if anybody remembers Growl. OK, thanks. That, that, that helps. Um, we're basically trying to steal Growl's model. We, have, we totally get the irony that right now we're asking you to install an app to not use apps. I mean, that's not lost on us, right? Um, the idea is that we want to install an app because that's the easiest way, that's the easiest injection mechanism to get the phone to behave as if it had an OS extension. And so we're giving away beacons at conferences like this. We're basically having this app to just get people to play with it, to say, does this make sense? And we're giving this out to uh, effectively labs and places that are kind of hanging out and playing with it. And I will state really unequivocally, please don't go to your manager and saying this is a really great product idea for your client. It's just not ready for that yet. But we also, I think, have a cool little escape hatch. If we can get everybody to broadcast URLs in a totally standard way, I'm actually meeting with Bluetooth SIG on Monday in Cambridge to try to get our little packet standardized, um, is that if everybody's broadcasting the same way, we can have effectively proprietary versions of clients doing their own thing. It's kind of like websites and browsers in some ways, right? And uh, that's why we're open sourcing it. That's why we have an iOS app and we have an Android app. And frankly, I would kill if someone were to port it to, say, Firefox OS or to Windows Phone. In fact, I would love for something other than Android to ship on their platform first. That'd be really cool. And, and also, there's a whole issue around how you do sorting and ranking, what kind of UI you have. There needs to be a lot of experimentation here. So. People forget that the delta between uh, Netscape and Gmail was 10 years. It takes a while for a community to sort itself out and for the layers and you know, to, to get Ajax took many innovations. And we expect this to be the same way. I'm thinking this is going to be a multi-year project. And it's going to take a while for this to end. But I don't want it to be this big monolithic thing. I want it to be a very narrow thing and have other things layer on top of it. Because companies like FedEx or DHL, I think, are great companies that are built on public, usually free, access to infrastructure. And we often forget, I mean, I think in the web we understand this, but to a certain extent, there's really only two kinds of ideas in my mind. There's truck ideas or there's road ideas. Either you're kind of, you're making a company or you're building infrastructure. The problem is that almost everybody just supports truck ideas. And what's been really weird is that these companies get bigger, they make their own toll roads. And then when people try to use them, they sue them. It's kind of getting things backwards. We've kind of lost that mojo that made the original internet. And I feel like we've got to kind of start thinking more about infrastructure type ideas. Does anybody know Malcolm McLean? Just curious if anybody ever heard of this guy. He's the guy who invented the shipping container, which I think you have heard of, right? This, this thing you know, works across boats and ships and trains. And, and when he first invented it, it was 26 times cheaper than existing longshoremen. And, um, he made a killing. He actually made a huge amount of money, but he realized he had a road idea. So in the 50s and 60s, he had like 100 patents. And what did this guy do? He just gave it all away. He completely took all the patents and just went Kind of like what Tesla did, by the way, the Tesla car thing last month, a couple, a couple months ago. And so what was this guy, some kind of communist pinko? It's like, no, he was a hard-nosed businessman. And I find it really amazing that we have to look back to the 50s and 60s to find someone who's actually more forward thinking than people today, because by doing it, he created a much bigger pie, and he became, frankly, made even more money. So what would you rather have? 75% of that little thing, or 25% of this huge, giant thing? And that's what I think happens when you have a road idea that really catches on. And so I feel like we've got to stop trying to fight over the existing web. We've got to change the web and have a whole new way of thinking about the web. So when we think about the future, it's really easy for us to get kind of blinded by the giants of the day. Now, I worked at Apple for a long time, much longer than I probably should have. But um, 
And I'm not mad at Apple. I'm really not. I mean, I've made a couple of comments about I iBeacon, but I think Apple, frankly, is great. and They're doing really great work. I'm actually mad at us as a community because we are copying Apple. We think apps or app-like thinking or app stores or lock-in, or as a, not we like you guys, but like we as like a broad community. So many people are like copying and aping what Apple has done. I think that's actually thinking too short term. So what I've done is, hopefully, every one of you have gotten one of these. And it's effectively a quick and dirty beacon that lets you play with it. It is not secure. It is not meant for public deployment. This is, meant, this is like the Arduino of, of beacons, OK? And the idea is that I can, I can hear them beeping right now. Thank you for trying that. Um, the idea is that what you'll do is you will install the physical web app. It's, it's on iOS. It's also on Android. Uh, if you want, you can go to the GitHub and download the version yourself and make your own. We have source code for both iOS and your Android now up there. And then we, once you install it, and by the way, I will warn you right now, if everybody tries to like, connect to their beacon, it probably won't work very well. So I'll just warn you. So the intention is that when you get a chance and you're not surrounded by 25 people, you can configure your beacon to any URL you want, and then you profit. Um, but the intention is for you to just play with this, to check it out. I also firmly appreciate and respect the fact that half of you think this is a totally rubbish idea. That is totally fine. But half of you probably don't. So please, even though there are five or each, I would appreciate you not throwing them away. So if any of you don't really like it, please find someone to give it to, because it's frankly much more fun to have two or three of these things. And if you do want to have more of them, go to the GitHub, because you can do Arduino and Raspberry Pi, and there's something for Edison on there. There's, uh, there's also, all sorts of ways for you to get more beacons. Um, and so just, just play with it and give it to a friend. So that's our URL. And I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the day to talk to you guys. And I really appreciate the hard questions, the questions that say it won't work. So please, let's try to think about this as a community and try about building it together. So thanks very much for your time. <laughs>